another episode of Wix Sonar. I'm your host, Luke Velasco, of course, joined by Tony Mulvey. It's a, we've got a fantastic episode for you today. This is our last episode before our event next week in Northwest Arkansas, the future of supply chain. So we've got a special guest with us that'll be joining here in just a few minutes. Um, but Tony, it's a... Uh, it's Star Wars Day, May the 4th. It is. And yeah. yes, I very cheesingly chose the title of today's show to be the, you know, may the freight be with you. I don't care if you give me flack for it, it's happening. But uh, are you a Star Wars fan, Tony? I'm not. Uh, I can't say. I think I've watched one or two of the movies, but I definitely haven't got all the way through them. So It's okay. Nobody's perfect. But, um, Tony, we've got some very important things to get to because, you know, when you and I jumped on this show, really diving into where the state of the market was, about five weeks ago, we were really looking at the downtrend in the trucking market. Craig Fuller, our CEO, you know, boldly called the freight recession. It seems like since then, a lot of things have evolved and a lot of signs are pointing towards, you know what, that, that really may evolve. Yeah. You know, ha has, have things changed much that would alter our perspective on an incoming freight recession over the last couple of weeks? I think the big one is you've kind of seen volume levels kind of stabilize mm -hmm. over the past, let's call it two weeks. Uh, I mean, you had Easter, which obviously, obviously pay, played an impact in those right. tender volume levels, but then they kind of came back up following Easter and we're kind of at that same level. Yeah. Look on the accepted volume side, volumes are basically flat year over year. Uh, so, I mean, but then you look to China and, yeah. and what's coming down the pipeline. And that's where a lot more concern needs to be given because yeah. the downturn and lockdown that happened in China, Craig talked about it this morning on Freight Waves Now, you really saw this significant downturn right there at the beginning of April. You think 28 days or so now with the, the transit times and things like that to get to the port guess what, that stuff's not coming to the port. Like those, those volume levels have declined 25, 28% yeah. could get fall down as low as 50%. I mean, we're talking a significant decline. This kind of happened in 2018 yeah. too. Yeah, it yeah, it did. With a pull forward of inventory ahead of those tariffs. And then we saw volumes fall roughly in that 28 day range, uh, about 6% on a national level. So. Check LA first here yeah, in the coming no, weeks, definitely. and then obviously those impacts to the national market. What, I, what, I'm, what I'm very interested to, to talk about too, and this is where we're gonna bring our guest on here in just a minute, but um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the freight recession and really, and, and really it's been centered around a truckload freight recession. Some of the other modes like intermodal and ocean don't seem to have been impacted for now. Flatbed as well, doesn't seem to have been impacted yet being the key word. Um, but I wanna bring on one of our guests here. He's got a lot of experience in the intermodal and the drayage space, and I, and, and I think it'll be great to kind of offer a different perspective from that regard. So um, let's welcome on uh, Davis Carpenter. He's the head of sales over at AgForce. Um, uh, Davis, how are you doing today? Hey, Luke. Hey, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, glad you were able to join us. Um, Davis, this is your first time on uh, on Freight Waves TV, right? It sure is. It's my very first time. Yep. That's great. I see you got a new haircut just for it, so you know we're excited for it. No, I'm kidding. But uh, hair looks great, by the way. More importantly, here, uh, Davis, for for those that aren't aware, uh, you know who who is AgForce? Just kind of give us a little snippet there for the viewers who may not be aware. Yeah, yeah. So AgForce is a nationwide uh, logistics, logistics provider um, of multimodal services, um, including truckload, intermodal, drayage, LTL, flatbed, bulk, and refrigerated. So uh, we really do offer a lot of services uh, for our customers. Um, AgForce is owned by Consolidated Grain and Barge. Um, and CGB is an innovative and progressive leader in the grain and transportation industry since 1969. Um, so our mission really as a company, I would say, is uh, to redefine and simplify uh, third-party logistics, um, doing this through flexibility um, and also providing solutions for our customers. I like that. Yeah, and, and, and definitely definitely a diverse, uh, you know, group there of, of services that you guys provide. And I think that's what's interesting, right? You know, because we've been seeing a lot of softening in the freight market, particularly towards van and flat, uh, van and reefer. Flatbed still seems to be pretty tight. Uh, intermodal still seems to be pretty tight. Drayage still seems to be pretty tight. Um, 
you know, from from your perspective, right, where where your experience has been, right, kind of, you know, tell us what are what are some of the things that you know your customers look for, a shipper would look for, um, you know, when you're communicating the differences between, you know, hey, potentially a softening or a down market on the van side, but then if you're also helping that customer perhaps on the flatbed or the drayage side. And those markets are in different places. How are you communicating some of those differences? Yeah, so I mean, I would say we are, you know, as a company, we try to, you know, we try to outweigh the two options and see what's going to be a best fit for our customer. Um, so obviously, you know, truckload and intermodal really operate the same way. Um, you know, on the intermodal side, you use you use rail for the line haul portion, um, and drage cares to do the pickups and delivery. So. We really just try to, uh, you know, look at our customer scenario as far as their supply chain and figure out what's going to be the best solution uh, for them as a, as a company, uh, whether it's budget wise or if it's, you know, transit. We really try to um, just take, you know, a full look at their supply chain and see how we can best uh, provide solutions for them. What are, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of volatility in the market. It's affected different parts of the industry differently, right? What are some things you guys have had to pivot with in order to, you know, stay, stay relevant, stay at the top, stay engaged with your customers uh, during the, you know, the last 18, 24 months? Yeah. So, I mean, I would say, you know, we've really, you know, we've really beefed up our care base, you know, quite a bit. We have tried to, you know, remain consistent with the market. Um, we rely heavily on sonar data, you know, to keep us, you know, in tune with the market um, as far as, you know, keeping rates in line, uh, making sure that our customers are, are in line with the market. Um, so, yeah, really just, you know, in a sense, just, you know, doing what's best for our customers um, and, you know, providing that service, uh, customer service and, you know, trying to keep transportation costs down at the end of the day. I want to pull something up here, too. So we've got a chart here in Sonar. You know, typically, traditionally, we've been leading a lot with truckload and stuff. But today, I actually want to lead with the intermodal side. So let's go ahead and throw this chart up here. Um, this is, this is a, for, for those that aren't aware much on the intermodal side, uh, I mean, Davis, great, great description of, I think, you know, kind of the differences in intermodal and truckload. But from, from this perspective on this chart, what this is showing, this is domestic rail container volume. So re really, these are 53-foot intermodal containers. This, this isn't the 20s or the 40s that you oftentimes are, are seeing move. These are specifically 53s. Um, that number at the top right is the number of containers, seven-day moving average. Um, big dips you see there, those are your holidays. Um, but this is a one-year time frame as of this morning. Simplest way to look at this, we're about 5% higher than we were this time last year. And all the way on the left, that blue line is a little bit lower than the blue line all the way in the top right. Um, basically, there's a little bit more volume moving um, domestic intermodal container volume than there was this time last year. Um, <clears throat> Tony, we're going to let you give an insight in a second, but Davis, from your perspective, are you guys seeing this this bump at all? Are you guys seeing any transition, more shippers having an interest in entertaining intermodal versus truckload? Obviously, truckload is still still very still there, but relative to where it was a year ago, any transitions? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know, really, as we all know, consumer spends really slowed down here in, in the last few months. Um, warehouse inventory is at an all-time high. Um, and because of, you know, inventory levels being high um, and a slowed down demand, shippers aren't as much of a hurry to get products on the shelves. Um, and to top that all off, you have a diesel prices at a record high. And I think just as a result of that, I think you're going to see a lot of shippers converting long haul uh, over the road lanes to rail in efforts to reduce their transportation costs. You're, you're speaking Tony's language right yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're spot on. I mean, that's kind of what we've been talking about for the past few months, I mean, if you look at it in that chart, you look at March and April, which was yeah. really where we saw that decline in truckload volumes, right? And that this that kind of service oriented, hey, we need our freight yeah. at this warehouse, this DC at this time. You don't really have that as much when the consumer is a lot slower. I mean, we talked about retail sales, real retail sales being negative uh, year over year uh, or yeah, year over year and month How over month. How is that different from fake retail sales? Well, they're adjusted for inflation. So oh, the okay. actual headline retail sales numbers don't include any inflation adjustments. So that's why they were up in uh, March over February. I think it was like 0.5, but then... Helps when gas prices are very high. Yeah, so Among you start things. factoring in inflation at <clears throat> up 1.2% month over month in March. Yeah. 
it turns those negative. And really, I mean, the impacts you're seeing are rail volumes are strong and yeah. truckload volumes are softening. Let's, we got another chart here. Let's compare the, the truck versus the, uh, the intermodal or the rail volumes here. Because um, I, I think this really paints a picture for where, how these two markets have been moving over the last couple of weeks. So, um, so, blue line or, so blue line for reference is truckload tender volume. We've seen that. If you've been watching the show at all, you've seen that chart before. That's the blue line. That's truckload tender volume as of this morning. Again, big dips there, holidays, very seasonal. So that's as of this morning over the last year. So massive dip there. There's kind of that leveling off we've seen over the last week and a half or so, a little bump from Easter, We're kind of hanging out. Time will tell where we go from here on the truckload side. Intermodal, that's the green line. We were just looking at that on the previous chart. Um, it, it's, held up, it's held up beautifully. In fact, it's up from this time a year ago. So I, I think this kind of really, really paints a picture as to how those two are moving um, you know, arguably in opposite directions. Um, very extreme there. Yeah, for sure. Um, Davis, when you're looking at something like this, right, you know, and you, obviously, you know, you guys, are, you guys are in a position where you have to move a lot of your customers' freight, right? You have to explain these situations. How do, you, how do you explain something like this? Do you basically, do you go to your customers and say, hey, intermodal volumes are up, we should, we should move there to try to, to try to cut some costs? Do we, do we stay on the truckload side? Do we take advantage of a potentially decreasing or softening truckload market? How do you explain something like this to your customers? You know, what's the, what's the approach? Yeah, so we really try to outweigh the two. Um, obviously, this is a you know this is a very interesting chart looking at seeing uh, the intermodal volumes continue to rise while while the truck mar- truckload markets really continue to soften. Um, so domestic intermodal uh, volumes they were up in Q1. I think as you see uh, the truckload market start to soften, I really do think you're going to see intermodal uh, intermodal and railroads uh, really start to become more competitive and 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 uh, be there with the with the truckload market. Um, so we saw uh, just r- less than a week ago on May 1st, Union Pacific, uh, we received, received a notification from them uh, just saying that their surcharge on all their EMP and UMAX equipment uh, for transactional, uh, they were lowering their surcharge um, out of LA, out of the West Coast, so out of LA, Oakland, and Seattle. Um, and I think they're doing that in efforts to remain competitive with the truckload market. So, you know, really, I'd say, I'd say every lane's different. Um, you know, depending on if it's going if it's going east to west or west to east, um, I really think we just try to you know follow the data and see what is going to be a best fit for our customer. Now, when you look at the difference between truckload and intermodal, right? Is there a particular ratio that customers tend to lean on when it comes to, you know, hey, oh, there's this much potential savings with intermodal versus truckload. I'm now going to move to that versus staying on truckload. Is there a ratio that you see reoccurring from customers? I'm sure it varies a little bit customer to customer, but is there a benchmark? Yeah, you know, I can't say there's a, you know, there's a certain ratio there, but obviously, you know, at the end of the day, intermodal is a cost saving uh, a mode for customers. I mean, uh, you know, depending on the lane, especially for long hauls, um, we typically do see uh, significant cost savings. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it doesn't work for, you know, every, every customer's supply chain. Um, some customers are in need of the product quicker than others. Um, others can afford to have the longer transit times, um, but, you know, obviously getting the, the lower rates along with it. So really, uh, you know, I can't say that there's a certain ratio between the two, uh, but I do know that, you know, we, we have customers that, you know, are, are want to avoid the rail and stay away from it. And we have others that are, you know, they prefer to be on the rail if, um, if you know, at all possible. And if obviously it's a cheaper cost um, for that particular lane. Yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a great point there. There isn't necessarily a magic formula and it, it does change shipper to shipper. I mean, we've seen a lot in the ESG space, at least that being mentioned, right? Where the rail is more ESG friendly yeah. or environmentally friendly than the, the truckload market but it comes at a cost, right? And that's that service that the truckload market provides. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a bit of a gap there. I, I want to, I want to pull this up to, um, you know, another chart we're gonna we're gonna bring here, and it's it's really we're gonna look at the co- the contract rates um, and really the difference there between intermodal and and uh, and dry van specifically right now. Let's go ahead and throw this up. So. You're going to look at these a little bit. So you've got that orange line there. That's that top line. That's the average van contract rate per mile um, uh, paid by shippers um, over the last year. Um, and then that, that blue line 
is the uh, average line haul contract rates uh, for uh, shippers that they've paid uh, for intermodal, 53-foot intermodal uh, van containers over that same period of time. So definitely a little bit of a gap there. Notice that big drop, though, in rates over the last couple of weeks, and then we kind of bounced there. So I wonder if the, it looks like we've seen a couple of dips there on the intermodal side. It seems to be a little bit more sensitive to some of those holidays. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I think you look at this chart and, and you really do see that gap, that difference in that price. And that's where the service factor comes in. I mean, Davis, try, feel free to chime in. But I mean, you look at this and it's like, why? There are, I mean, other than service, like what, what are the benefits of, say, truckload versus intermodal or vice versa? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's significant savings based off that data right there. I mean, being uh, us the dollar, uh, you know, dollar per mile less than truckload, um, you know, there, the, like I said earlier, intermodal has its benefits and it has its disadvantages. So, you know, it works for some customers, for some it doesn't. Um, you know, I would say, you know, I would say, you know, at the end of the day, most customers are concerned about cost, um, at least from what we see on our side. So, you know, I would say, you know, that's a that's a that's a very interesting chart to look at, and you know, I think that uh, I think the intermodal, you know, obviously is a is a is a great solution. Um, I think I think the railroads need to do, you know, need some work as far as um, you know fixing the chassis issues, equipment availability, um, and then you know really just uh, clearing through that congestion from a, a, cr a crazy 2021. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head there too with that, like equipment availability. I mean, if, if you know, think about it, we don't have it here in front of us, but there's a lot of sonar data that talks about how many containers are moving, how many are full versus how many are empty on the intermodal side. And I can't tell you, there's there are there are certain markets where there's just no empty containers. So like, even if you want it to move intermodal, you couldn't, which kind of begs the question of why aren't these intermodal companies charging more in some of those markets? You know, do you ever yeah, run absolutely. into those situations? Oh, all the time. All the time. I mean, we'd, we'd see a deficit of equipment, um, you know, especially for the railroad and equipment with the EMP and UMAX containers. Absolutely. Um, you've seen a lot in the, in the news recently about, you know, companies, at, asset providers such as like J.B. Hunt, um, wow. that they said that they're going to look to expand their fleet to 150,000 um, here in the next three to five years. So that'd be almost a 40 percent increase. So I think you're seeing the asset uh, intermodal providers really starting to beef up their fleets. Um, I think the railroads need to look at... Uh, they need to look at expanding the railroad-owned equipment fleets as well. Yeah, totally, totally agree here. Um, Davis, probably the most important questions we're going to ask tonight. Are you? A, we, we've established that Tony's not a Star Wars fan. Are you a Star Wars fan? You know, I can't oh, say man. I am. I can't I say know. I am. Oh, it hurts. I'm by myself here. I mean, I was named after, you know, the, a Star Wars character. So I wasn't, actually. It was just my parents liked the name, and it happened. I was, anyways. Well, that's too bad because, you know, today is Star Wars Day, so I'm here by myself, but that's okay. It's all right. We'll, we'll make do. Um, the, so are you not going to watch the new uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi show? I will probably not. You probably don't even know what that is, do you? Not really. Yeah. You ever heard of Disney? I, I do. I do have a Disney Plus subscription, okay. but it's not right. on the top of my list. Small, small indie company. They, they produce kind of small like YouTube films and that kind of thing. Anyways, um, well, no worries. Uh, well, Davis, thanks so much for, for jumping on here today. Um, you know, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, Tony and I, for, for those watching, hang out. We're going to talk a couple things on the ocean and international side and in regards to China um, in a minute. Um, Davis, if folks want to get in touch with you uh, to learn more about what you guys do and, um, and, and just, to, just to communicate, bounce heads together, you know, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, so our LinkedIn, uh, AgForce Transportation Services, you can find us on LinkedIn. Our website, uh, agforcets.com, um, is where you can find us on the website. And then obviously you can reach out to me and, and find me um, anywhere, you know, from LinkedIn, uh, reach out my email or my, or my phone. So anyways, thanks again, Luke, for having me on and uh, have a good rest of your day. Absolute pleasure, Davis. Take care. Thank you. Dropping some knowledge bombs there. Yeah, great stuff. Great yeah. stuff. He made a good point too, you know, like, and, and I think the intermodal side it, is in an interesting place there. Like he talked about J.B. Hunt increasing, they're making a pledge to increase their equipment almost 40%. I mean, that is a ton. They're going from around 105, 110,000 containers all the way up to 150 in the next three to five years. Yeah. That's an operation. Yeah, it's crazy, but I mean, you have to remember where container manufacturing really comes from. Yeah. It comes from China. I think it's like 90% of container yeah. manufacturing comes from China. 
I mean, I know J.B. Hunt has, I think they wanted to add 9,000 or something uh, containers like within the next quarter uh, or that are on the way. Right. So, I mean, you are seeing that increase container capacity, right? right? But that doesn't fix some of the other issues that the railroads are fixing. I mean, you're talking crew starts, things like that that aren't necessary. It's the same thing that's happening in the airlines, right? You're yeah. seeing flights canceled and it has to do with crew availability as much as it does anything else, right? So there are some other impacts than other, just that are impacting the intermodal side and rails yeah. in general, other than just that equipment availability. But what you're seeing, obviously, volumes are still holding up pretty yeah. strong. And you listen to the calls with analysts from the, after these earnings reports from both JB Hunt and Hub Group, yeah. which are two of the big intermodal players, they're pretty bullish. Yeah, very bullish. And I think you're right. You know, it's, it, we're skipping over something very important here. You talk about the airlines canceling flights. They better not cancel our flight down to Northwest Arkansas for the future supply chain event. A little promotional plug there real quick. Um, but, no, it is, it is interesting that that is happening a lot. And we're also seeing rejections on the ocean side increase as well. It's happening across the board. We, apart from truckload, like we have an equipment problem in a lot of areas, but not really truckload right now partly because capacity increased so much over the last two years, but also with that demand falling, not a good combination to bring the two together. Yeah, I mean, another point, I mean, looking at earnings calls. Yeah. I mean, Werner generated almost $20 million from cash, sale, basically $20 million in sales yeah. on assets. I mean, you're looking at the large truck, you've seen this influx of capacity on the truckload side, right? We were talking, what, 170,000 new dispatchable trucks? Well, yeah. the big guys aren't growing their fleets that fast, which tells yeah. me, which is where this whole bloodbath scenario plays out, right? Yeah. It's, it's for it's, the little guys. It's coming from the, the carriers with 10 trucks or less. Yeah. Those are the ones that don't have the cash flow or necessarily the density to continue. Look at what fuel diesel prices are doing. They jumped up think they're at record high. I mean, five dollars and right? fifty cents. Yeah, five fifty-five somewhere which is in there. Crazy. I mean, it's seventy. I mean, if you think seven miles to a gallon for a truck, you're talking seventy-one or seventy-seven cents per mile in cost. I saw a post on. Um, I saw a post uh, the other day. A guy, one hundred and thirty-six gallon tank or something, and he he just tapped a thousand dollars to fill up his tank. Yeah, a thousand dollars to fill up a tank. Yeah, and the problem is you're paying that. When you fill up, you're done, and you're getting paid much later. Yeah. I mean, sometimes 30, 60 days after right. you move load. So that's right. that's where it kind of creates this. Or squeeze. you have to pay like a three percent fee to get your money early. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, this is and that cuts it, into that money as well. So it's yeah, it, it, it's a double hit, and that's again, it all goes back to some of those that bloodbath for the smaller guys. And the thing with like the Warner, they're selling their three-year-old used trucks for like one hundred forty thousand dollars. That's why they're doing it. I mean, yeah. it they're it, taking advantage of that used truck market and they're generating. And they get to maintain higher contract rates than spot rates are falling below contract rates. It's a, it's a two-edged sword. Yep. I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's an absolute whammy. Um, uh, the, the last thing that we want, we want to touch briefly on China, we're, we're, about to, to, we're, about, we're about to finish the show here, but um, you know, China, we're, we're seeing import bookings still fairly elevated right now, right? And I, think, I don't think we've really seen the, the trickle-down effect from China on, on the U.S. rate market yet. No, I think we're still a couple weeks away from it yeah. really impacting freight volumes here in the U.S. I mean, what you're seeing is longer transit times, shorter lead times. Yeah. And the shorter lead times, it's if they can get a container on a vessel, yeah. like they're just taking advantage. And I mean, it's how shippers kind of react to volatility. And it's the same thing that happens on the truckload market, right? When, you've, right? when you get this volatility, you see those shorter lead times. You're kind of seeing it on the ocean side, but it, it really is, you're, we haven't seen the impacts of China. What we've seen so far is just kind of a domestic problem. Yeah. Once we have the international issues that are going on factored in, that's when you're gonna see yeah. it really, this lull in, in freight volumes. Uh, yeah, I think that's when we're gonna see how, if this, freight recession goes beyond just the truckload market. And if it really starts to impact some of those areas and trickles down. Um, folks, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, uh, on the show here today. Next week, we will actually be live in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we'll film on Tuesday, so you might be able to view the show on Tuesday, but we will also 
uh, re-air the show the next day on Wednesday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, so you're welcome to tune in for that. Um, if you're there, if you're going to be at the event, we look forward to seeing you, and if not, uh, I will catch you on the next show. Uh, Luke and Tony, thanks again to uh, uh, Davis at Ag Force for joining us earlier today. Have a fantastic rest of your day, folks. Take care. Thank you.